Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to Nature and You, Tuliomi's lecture series for August 2021. And tonight we're going to hear about the secret lives of wood ducks. Uh, I'm going to start out by telling you a little bit about Tuliomi. I think many of you have been to enough of these lectures that you're sick of hearing about Tuliomi, but uh, uh, just a little bit. We are a woodland based nonprofit. We are a conservation nonprofit. So, what we do is we uh, work uh, at the, some of the natural areas in Yolo Lake, Napa County area. Specifically, we concentrate on the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument, and we also are working on the Woodland Regional Park in Woodland. In, in a nutshell, what we want is people to appreciate and understand the nature in our region and go out and hike and see some beautiful nature. We're going to start right away with Dr. John Eady, and he is a professor at UC Davis, uh, and he is a waterfowl professor, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about himself and go right into wood ducks. So welcome, John. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. Again, uh, folks, let me know if you can't hear me. Um, I'm using a head mic, so the sound is a little bit better, um, but we may have some challenges because I do have some videos with sound, so we'll see how that goes. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. This is a uh, an absolute pleasure to talk about one of my passions. Um, this is one of the, the various projects that we're involved in at UC Davis, but it's one of the most fun. And, and it's with this gorgeous bird, the wood duck, which really is, uh, you know, it, it's gotta be one of the most beautiful birds in North America and certainly the most beautiful species of waterfowl. Um, so let me, let me begin by just telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I am very privileged to hold the Dennis G. Raveling Endowed Chair in Waterfowl Biology at UC Davis. Uh, that was a chair that was established in 1995 when Dennis Raveling, who was just a giant in the field, uh, passed away prematurely. Um, I'm a Canadian. I, you'll probably pick that up in my accent, even though I've been here 26 years. But uh, I came down, I was very fortunate to receive this position after teaching at the University of Toronto. Um, my background is in, in population ecology, behavioral biology. Um, I was interested in avian conservation and management. Uh, a lot of what I do deals with wetland conservation and waterfowl conservation. And the endowed chair was, uh, was really set up to, to look at waterfowl conservation and wetland conservation issues in the agricultural landscape. However, I have an alter ego. I am a bird nerd uh, and more specifically, I am a duck nut. So. Uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with Latin, I guess that would make me a, an anatophile for the family nowadays. Um, I pretty early in my in my education, I got uh, for whatever reason uh, pretty enthusiastic about waterfowl and their incredible diversity of behaviors and plumages and life histories. But tonight, I'm going to start with a fairy tale. All good talks just start with a fairy tale. And uh, I'm assuming this is one that many of you know, the story of the ugly duckling. And this is a, a, a duckling purportedly that's hashed out in a nest and he looks very different from all the other ducklings in the, in the nest. And they all make fun of him and, uh, and all the other birds on the pond make fun of this, uh, this poor little ugly duckling. But it turns out this duckling grows up and to become a beautiful swan. This is Hans Christian Andersen's story. And, uh, and of course now becomes, you know, the envy of everybody in the marsh. And, you know, I took this story to heart as a kid. You know, I thought, hey, there's hope for me after all. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, many of us, I have three daughters, they're all grown now, but, you know, I read this story to them when they were youngsters and, and, uh, and it never really dawned on me. I'm wondering if it's dawned on you to ask the question, how did that swan egg get in the duck's nest in the first place? Mm -hmm. Seems like a fairly trivial kind of question, but it's one that I have to confess uh, has sort of perplexed me for a, a good number of years and has led to some of the research that I'll talk about tonight. So my entry into this uh, fairy tale, however, was not with wood ducks, which are the star of the show tonight. It was actually with golden eyes. Um, for both my master's degree and uh, PhD, I worked on common golden eyes shown here. You can tell with their lovely circular crests. You can, you can tell a common golden eye, quite, quite abundant throughout most of uh, the boreal forest area through North America. 
but I also worked on Barrel's Goldeneye, which are more restricted to the West Coast, small population in Quebec and Iceland. And you have this more crescent shaped uh, face. So just gorgeous, gorgeous birds in black and white. And the females are gorgeous as well. Chocolate brown heads and, and yellow or orange bills, depending on the species. Uh, they're cavity nesting birds. So they rely on these big open cavities that species like pileated woodpeckers create. Um, they lay their eggs in these cavities. They will use nest boxes and nest boxes will become a bigger part of the story tonight uh, with wood ducks. But uh, golden eyes use them as well as, as do several other cavity nesting waterfowl. The female incubates the eggs for about 28 to 30 days and then the young hatch out and within 24 to 48 hours, they leap from the nest like most cavity nesting ducks do. And, uh, and then uh, the, the female takes care of them uh, by herself for about uh, two months or so afterwards. So here's, uh, here's the young John many years ago, back in the, back in the 1980s. Um, and so I, you know, I was studying golden eyes for my, both my master's thesis and, and my PhD. And, and I recall, uh, here's a golden eye nest, and they normally lay clutches of about seven or eight eggs, maybe as many as nine for a single nest, these lovely blue green eggs. And I remember uh, when I first started this work, working in Northern Ontario, um, I was, uh, I was, you know, canoeing along these northern lakes and, and climbing up these trees with climbing spurs and so forth and came across a nest uh, that had 20 eggs in that case. And I thought, what the heck is going on? Uh, you know, they mostly lay eight to 10 eggs and this is double. I thought somebody was playing a joke on me. I was working with several other um, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resource uh, Fish and Wildlife biologists. And I thought they were just fooling this young kid and, and, uh, I, I remember distinctly, you know, going back up the lake after finding this nest back to our cabin and uh, thinking, oh my gosh, what's, what's going on with this? If I messed up somehow, am I going to get fired? And I, and I told the other uh, fish, the bi other biologists, fish and wildlife biologists about this nest with 20 eggs. And they all said, oh no, that can't be right. No, no, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You messed up somewhere. And I just couldn't figure it out. And then, uh, and then we found several other nests later on that had, you know, 16 eggs, 18 eggs. 20 eggs, uh, well more than any single female could produce. Um, and that sort of stuck with me. And so I, I was, this was my master's degree at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. And I came across a paper by Yoram Yavtov. This is in 1980, so that ages me. And it was called Intraspecific Nest Parasitism in Birds. I hadn't heard of this before. And, and this type of parasitism is, is unique. So some of you may already know sort of the punchline where I'm going with this, but you know, my familiarity, familiarity at that point was, you know, parasitism was about ectoparasites or, you know, things like ticks, for example, or, uh, or endoparasites, like the nasty worms, tapeworms, other types. But, but this is a type of uh, reproductive parasitism. Uh, and the classic examples are the brood parasites. And these are species like Cuckoos and cowbirds. Most of you, I'm sure, are are pretty familiar with them. Um, so this, uh, the picture on the left here is a is this is actually not a bird eating another bird. This is the European cuckoo, uh, which has laid its egg in the nest of a reed warbler, a sedge warbler, and this is the parent sedge warbler who's raising this uh, this foster child that that actually grows larger than the reed warblers. And cuckoos are nefarious. There's there's been quite a bit of research and they actually will, once they hatch out, they're blind and naked, but they have this instinctive response for kicking eggs out of the nest, you know, so that they get rid of all of the other uh, host's eggs and they can sequester the parental care all by themselves uh, of the foster parents. So quite, quite a bit of work had actually been done on it. I, I became familiar with it as a graduate student. But that didn't explain the golden eye story. The golden eye story is a bit of a twist on this. And it's not parasitism between species. The cuckoo and the cowbird, they never have a nest of their own. They only lay their eggs in the nest of other birds and rely entirely on those other species to raise their young. It's a great gig if you can get away with it. But this was a case of what seemed to be parasitism within species. It's called conspecific parasitism. So the idea is you have this poor female sitting on a nest. Another female comes in and she's a parasite. She lays an egg in that nest and then she leaves. And you can imagine, I mean, this is, this is really quite a good deal for the parasite. So they don't have to care for the young, incubating them, taking care of them after they hatch. And presumably there's some cost to the host female that she now has extra eggs and extra young to take care of. 
So that's phenomena called intraspecific or conspecific group parasitism. And that's what Yomtov first cued me into way back in 1980 in that paper that has now become kind of a seminal paper. At that point, it was just he was just collecting information on you know, how common it was. It was a relatively um, unstudied phenomena. Uh, and there really were no answers as to why would females lay their eggs in other females' nests. So now we enter, uh, now the, the star of the show enters, uh, stage right, the wood duck. Um, absolutely just a gorgeous bird. I, you know, I fell in love with them as a, as a kid. Um, we had them uh, on our pond in a lake in British Columbia where I grew up. Um, just spectacular looking, both, both the male and the female. And they have actually been studied fairly extensively, certainly, you know, probably for well over 50 or 60 years. Uh, this gentleman on the left is Frank Belrose, and he's just the absolute sort of godfather of anything you could possibly want to know about wood ducks. Wrote a beautiful book with Dan Holm, just a, just a tome. And then people like Gary Hepp and so forth have, have really added to our knowledge. So there's quite a bit known about them. Um, Wood ducks actually have a quite a disjunct distribution. So there's an Eastern population and that's where they're most common. That's where most of the work has happened. But there's also a Western population and particularly in California, but it also gets up into Oregon and Washington, a little bit into BC where I was, that was where our, our farm was when I grew up. And um, the, the reddish color represents breeding. The purple is where they overlap both uh, winter and summer. And then the blue is the non-breeding. So you can see here in California, they're both wintering and breeding. And in fact, um, we've done some genetic work and the California population is actually distinct from the, from the Eastern population. So this big continental divide seems to have separated them into, into two somewhat different genetic groups. But there wasn't as much work done on the California population. Um, and in fact, uh, very little was known really until folks like the California Waterfowl Association started their wood duck program and, and people uh, like my friend Steve Simmons, who, who sadly has passed recently, um, conducted sort of longer term studies and, and uh, but we still don't know that much ab about them. You may know that the wood duck really was on the verge of extinction back in the, uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, it was feared that it would, it would become extinct. Um, just this quote, this is from one of Frank Belrose's papers uh, that so persistently has this duck been pursued that in some sections it's been practically exterminated as a result. The wood duck is constantly diminishing in numbers and soon is likely to be known only from books or by tradition. So that was back in the, uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, a couple of major reasons. One was completely unregulated harvest and market hunting. So, you know, uh, hunters would go out and, and just shoot hundreds of birds and they would ship them off to market. There was no regulations whatsoever, federally, state or otherwise. And so over harvest was a, was a real concern back in the early 1900s. Um, the other factor is forest loss. These are birds that nest in cavities and uh, they require large mature forests in, in which to breed. And so here's just a picture of the forest back in the 1620. These are all the hardwood forests. And this is what that same uh, you know, picture would look like back in the 1920s. So particularly back east, we got rid of a lot of the hardwood, set, hardwood forests as we you know, converted this land to agriculture and then ultimately to urban dwellings. So two big factors, um, the wood duck has returned. So here's just a little bit of the conservation success story, perhaps one of the biggest conservation success stories in North America. Uh, and part of that was the Migratory Bird Treaty Act um, from 1918. So it's one of the oldest and more, most important wildlife conservation laws. I would say it really is the very first conservation law that has had wide ranging impact in North America, perhaps the world. So that limited um, market hunting, limited harvest, started putting regulations in place so that uh, we were not over harvesting uh, the populations, not just wood ducks, but other migratory birds. And it, it was a multinational agreement between, uh, between Canada and the United States and, um, and Mexico is now uh, also um, involved in many of the programs that came out of the Migratory Bird Act. It's still between Canada and the United States. The other thing was, was gradually replacing those, uh, those you know, hardwood forests to, to get natural cavities. And a third part was, uh, was a nest box program. So here's Frank Belrose. And uh, he really was, uh, was sort of the, the originator, uh, one, of the, one of several, of, of since we had lost all these hardwood forests with these natural cavities, maybe we can replace them by putting up some sort of simulated cavity or a nest box. And indeed that, that worked. This is a very old version of a nest box cavity. 
So that brings me to the wood duck in California. All right, so here we are with, uh, with the real star of tonight's show, the wood duck in California. Now, historically, I mean, as you, I'm sure you all know, you know, we have lots of uh, streams and rivers, major watersheds throughout all of California, coming down and coming out through, you know, the, the Bay Delta region from um, both the San Joaquin as well as the Sacramento area, the coastal areas. And all of these rivers and streams with their little tributaries would have, uh, you know, 100, 150 years ago, these massive oak galleries, just uh, they could be as much as a mile wide, old oak hardwood forests, these big old oaks streams running through them, very pristine, sort of gnarly habitats, just ideal habitat for a wood duck to breed and, and for a female to hide and raise her ducklings. But of course, now with everything else, and, and as is typical um, in many places in North America, we re removed uh, many of those, uh, many of that, uh, those riparian forests. So now we just have little strips along the side, sometimes no more than a few trees wide where there used to be half a mile of oak trees, some cases none at all, uh, stripped bare. So we've gone from these wild riparian oak galleries to these sort of, uh, you know, canalized uh, um, sloughs and, and streams. And in some cases, uh, we've just lost all the water. Certainly this year with the drought is another concern. Uh, but also with uh, diversion for urban and agricultural areas. So there really is still a continuing concern about um, riparian habitats, uh, not just for wood ducks, a whole suite of riparian birds and mammals and, and uh, amphibians, reptiles. Wood ducks are cavity nesting. So they're, you know, similar to, uh, similar to golden eyes. So they nest in natural cavities and they do take well to wood ducks. And, and as I mentioned, that was, uh, that was part of a, uh, Part of an important part in the recovery of the wood duck is provision of artificial cavities. Um, I am hearing a little bit of an echo. I don't know if somebody has their mic on or not, or whether that's just me. Um, Bill, let me know if there's if there's any issues with the audio. I'm sort of speaking <laughs> in a vacuum here, and I have no idea. If, it if sounds I'm... it sounds great. Okay. It sounds great on my computer. Okay, that's great. Super. So, um, and actually one of the things I just want to point out, I mean, I've, I've taken a few photos offline. I do try to give credit to everybody that, uh, that I borrow a photo from or, or even ask them. Um, but a lot of the photos that you see in this talk are taken by my colleague, Bruce Lyon. I just want to give him credit. He's a fantastic photographer, also a sensational biologist and naturalist. He's a professor at UC Santa Cruz. So you'll see a lot of these photos that were taken by Bruce and uh, it sure is fun to, to collaborate and, and, and work with somebody who is so talented as a photographer. Here's another one of Bruce's one photos. Bruce's Oops, I'm getting some echo again. Um, so here is, uh, here's, you know, a male and a female wood duck. And so, you know, the usual story, the males will court the females. They actually, most waterfowl start breeding or start courting, start their, their mating displays quite early in the spring or even in the winter for some species. So wood ducks get going early and then, you know, come around uh, February, they'll, they'll start prospecting for nests and establishing a nest. And they'll typically lay a clutch. Here's a wood duck clutch and they'll typically lay a clutch of, uh, oh, 10 to 12 eggs, not many more than that. That's sort of a normal clutch. Uh, the female will incubate the eggs. So she'll pluck down from her breast and sit on the eggs for about 30 days or so, plus or minus. And then the young will hatch out and, you know, they're just so great. I don't know. I, working with ducklings. I mean, how can you how can you complain about that? It's uh, it's pretty spectacular. So here's here's a little video. Bill, let me know if this works. And again, I don't know if the audio works. So if it doesn't, uh, give me give me oops, give me a give me a shout. Um, I could not uh, not go through this talk without giving you baby ducklings. So let's see if this works. It's always a bit of a, you know, sort of an Easter egg uh, surprise coming into a box where all the youngsters have hatched out. And of course, there's always a troublemaker. This this youngster on the top wants to be king of the castle. Bill, could you hear that okay? That came through? Yeah, sounds great. Um, while I've got the mic on, I want to remind people that they can ask questions anytime using the chat. Absolutely, yeah. And Bill, Bill will keep track of that. And uh, I'm happy to stop the presentation and, and answer your questions as we go, or we can do it at the end. So let's just keep this really informal. All right, so um, once the kids hatch out, of course, the mom will go out and, and she'll sit at the base of the nest and, and call them. She's already looked for a good place to rear them uh, to, or to take them. And uh, you know, a big leap of faith, out they go. These, these little guys are 24 to 48 hours. Um, and uh, natural cavities can be you know, as much as uh, 20, 30 feet above ground. 
boxes usually aren't quite so high and away they go with the greatest of ease and they sort of flatten themselves out and they spread their their little webs like little air lawns uh it's really quite remarkable and uh and uh, then they hit the ground. So I'm going to try this. This is actually, this is a video of a, this is actually a mandarin duck. So they're an Asian species. They're the, in the same genus as a wood duck. They're not found in North America, except that they have now been introduced in California. So there is a small population of mandarin ducks, apparently up in Sonoma. I'm not sure if they're still around, but they're very similar. So I just wanted to show you, uh, it's something I show my classes about sort of the wonders of nest exodus. So let's see if this works. Oops, well, that didn't work. Let's try it again. Spring has also come early for the mandarin ducks. The female is leaving her nest high in the treetops. It's her job to lead the way. It's a long way down for a maiden flight. A few calls of encouragement are needed here. It's incredible how few of them actually uh, are injured on the exodus. There are still two missing. Only two days old and already one great adventure behind them. What will the rest of the year hold for our planet's latest recruits? Well, I hope that uh, that came through okay. It's always, it's always fun to show that in my classes and the students are, are amazed both that a duck would nest in a tree cavity. Secondly, that they would plummet to the earth like that. And, and then of course, all the uh, rather dramatic music that attends that uh, particular video is it's always good fun. So the youngsters, uh, you know, head out with uh, with the mom. They'll stay with the mom for, um, and I mean, in some cases, wood ducks will will be on their own thirty to forty five days after hatch. Usually, it's about two months, sixty days. So you can tell with this picture, these youngsters are now getting to about four or five weeks of age. Uh, so there is a question. Ah, go ahead. Have the ducklings been fed at all before they leave the nest? No, no, absolutely not. So one of the things about waterfowl is they have these big, energy rich eggs. The yolks are just packed with fat. And so um, just before they hatch, they, they, they still have quite a bit of yolk left and that just becomes absorbed. And that's their food base really for the first couple of days. But as soon as they hatch and leave the nest, they have to feed themselves. Their parents don't feed them. Um, so that, that yolk storage, that lipid storage, fat storage uh, helps get them through those first few days. But no, they're, they're, uh, they have to be on their game within about two days after hatching out. So no feeding by the, by the mother and no food uh, until they leave the nest. So yeah, great question. All right. Well, so let's go back to our, our ugly duckling story. This, uh, this, this paper of Yom Tov and this question that sort of perplexed me as a, as a graduate student. So wood ducks like golden eyes are also brood parasites. So they lay eggs, eggs in each other's nest and they actually take it to an extreme. So uh, in fact, uh, the, the literature has recorded what people refer to as dump nests as though females were literally dumping or getting rid of their eggs. Um, here, here's a picture. I, just a quick guess, how many eggs do you think uh, are in this nest? I'll give you 10 seconds. <laughs> it's like one of those jelly bean jar guessing games. Well, if you guess 35, you would be right. So that's, uh, and remember, wood ducks will probably lay 12 to 13 eggs, maybe as many as 14 on their own. So clearly multiple females. Um, we've had nests with more than 50 eggs. I mean, the eggs are almost just spilling out of the box. It's just really quite remarkable. 
some of the other remarkable things. So obviously you have more than one female using the same nest and that's, that's curious enough as it is. We also have had cases where females seem to be nesting side by side. Uh, but, and Frank Belrose has studied this extensively. There are cases where females will actually kill each other in the nest. So there's this really bizarre underworld that's going on in these birds. Um, this isn't new, people know about this, but we really haven't understood what the, so what the basis for it is. And so um, actually one of my current graduate students, Catherine Cook and, and another one, David Sheck have been using uh, these very simple trail cameras. I just want to take a bit of a sidebar here. Some of the biggest advances in science have nothing to do with ingenuity or, or you know, sort of some grand new theory, some really smart, uh, you know, sort of intellectual development. Often it's just about a new piece of technology that allows us to see the world in a way that we had not been able to before. And that goes all the way from the genome project to, to you know, everything we're doing in space and being able to assess climate change, et cetera. So this is very low tech, but these are just these little trail cams, which you can get off the shelf now. We just attach them to the roof of the box. And if you go online, there's tons and tons of these, these uh, camera videos and you can, watch, you can watch wood ducks in the nest boxes. So we've been doing that. Um, I just want to highlight some of the differences between these females to, to emphasize the perplexing complexity of their social interactions and social relationships. And we're, that's one of the things we're really trying to get a handle on. So. Here's a case, and this is, I think, about a two-minute video um, taken last year of, oops, sorry, of uh, two females who, uh, well, I'll let you decide for yourself how they, how they feel about each other. That's almost a bit too much. I, I have to assure you that, you know, we were not just simply watching this while it was going on. This was a remote camera. I think if I'd been there, I would have, uh, I certainly would have interrupted this, but I mean, it's absolutely remarkable. They're, they're, they're literally are fighting to the death in some of the cases. Um, and yet here's another example of another nest on the same ranch of two females. And it's a very different story. So here's the host female, another female comes in. And she just sits on top, no fighting, no reaction. Maybe a little nibble or two, just a little high. What is this other female doing on the top? Well, she is busy laying an egg, which you will see in a second. And there it is. She literally lays an egg on the back of the other female <laughs> uh, and no reaction whatsoever. So just completely different kinds of, of interactions amongst these females is quite bizarre. And, and you can find you know, other videos on, online as well. Um, Catherine is actually doing a more in-depth study about uh, the interactions between these females and their age and their, their relationships, et cetera. But so that, you know, why are females doing this? And why do some females nest together peaceably? Other ones are attacking each other. And, you know, really what's going on with this breeding system. So um, we've been looking at this mostly for the last uh, five or six years. We, we had been doing some longer term monitoring, but um, with my colleague, Bruce Lyon and Eli Bridge, uh, we've actually been sort of focusing on this a little bit more. And there's, there's kind of four prongs and I won't talk about all of this tonight, but just the, our research is, it's kind of trying to get an idea of who's doing what to whom and, and why might they be doing that. So it, it uses some of our new technology genetics and, uh, and some of the uh, pit tag technology I'll tell you about to try to find out what these birds are doing. Um, we have another whole set of studies looking at some of the, uh, the cognitive aspects of this behavior and, and the cues that females might be using uh, some of their sort of cue response relationships. Um, we have other students looking uh, much more at the endocrinological underpinnings of this. Um, 
the physiological basis of this behavior. There's a couple of students that are doing their PhDs, one who, who did her PhD. Uh, and I'll, I won't, I'll just give you a very snippet of that a little bit later on that, that moms actually might be manipulating the hormone profiles of their young and that could be uh, influencing what they do as adults. And then, and then you know, I, I always work on this interface between sort of fundamental behavior and ecology and population biology, but also wanting to apply that uh, to a conservation and management context. And so uh, I'll end the talk um, talking about some of the population dynamics and, and really about the pros and cons of some of these nest box management programs um, that have been important in their conservation, but, but also I think a deeper understanding of the behavior may help us uh, make these programs more effective. So that's where we're going. Um, and I'm just gonna touch on a few of these things. So here, you, jumping, into, uh, jumping into the science. Um, I actually, uh, uh, before I do, I just want to highlight that uh, this really has, I mean, it started out as a project initially when I came in 1996 to UC Davis, primarily as a, as a teaching tool. Um, wood ducks are great. They're a big robust bird because they nest in nest boxes. You can find them easily. Um, it's a really great uh, bird to work on to train undergraduates in terms of, you know, all the biological field skills they might need to work with birds. You know, they're not like hummingbirds, they're not small, you're not gonna, you're not gonna hurt them. And, um, and so we started this, uh, this up as an internship program and because they breed in the spring, you know, February, March, April, May, um, we can actually get students out while they're still in school at UC Davis during the spring quarter. So we've run this program for 22 years now uh, we've had over 600 students um, and at the peak 2014 to 2018 before COVID kind of impacted us, um, we had up to 50 or 75 per year. And, and it's just great for teaching them all the skills, the measurement skills, uh, radio telemetry, candling eggs, measuring eggs and ducklings, checking nest boxes. Um, and, and for the students, it's, it's, it's often their first hands-on experience with a wild living thing. Um, Peter Moyle, I saw that Peter came onto the came onto the talk. Peter, <laughs> hello, Peter, and and uh, Peter's been one of my heroes and mentors. Peter Moyle, um, the same thing that Peter has found with fish, for example, just providing students with that hands-on opportunity, that connectivity also just becomes established, and I don't think it goes away. And that's one of the one of the strengths of our program at Davis, and and one of the values of this wood duck program. Uh, this is a picture of young Sue on the right, and she's actually just finished her PhD at Cornell. So many of our students uh, go on to graduate work and, and research, uh, research or, or management positions. And all they get out of it is a darn t-shirt. So every year uh, we have a contest to design the logo and uh, the students each year, you know, uh, they all get a free t-shirt and that, that's for all of their labor. They spend a whole quarter doing the internship and, and we've been doing this for a number of years now. So it's a really great educational opportunity. It's also allowed us to collect a long-term database. And so we've had a, a good number of graduate students. These are all the graduate students and, and uh, a postdoc who've worked on the project. Um, so down, uh, Tez and Mitch uh, and Kara figure a lot in some of the data that I'll show you in a few minutes. And, and, uh, and Catherine and David are the, are the most recent two graduate students. Um, I also want to highlight that, that this is a collaborative project. It was funded on, by NSF and also by the Raveling Endowment um, with Eli Bridge at the University of Oklahoma and Bruce Lyon at UC Santa Cruz. Um, so they are full conspirators uh, in this work. So um, if you don't believe what I'm saying, you can blame them. And if you like what I'm saying, it's, uh, it's, it's probably actually all due to them too. <laughs> Okay, um, here are our study sites. So here we are in the Central Valley and we've, we've um, worked on populations at a number of ranches, uh, four or so down here. Hedgerow Farms, unfortunately, has kind of gone extinct because the water all dried up. Um, Roosevelt Ranch was a new one and now we're working quite extensively at Birdhaven Ranch. So here's the Butte, uh, the, the Sutter Buttes just to orient you. So um, yeah, and th these are all on sloughs and on streams. So our first question with this, uh, getting into this curious behavior is who's doing what and to whom? Uh, uh, so when we first started, this was work that uh, former PhD student, Nicole O'Dell did. And that was just sort of the early stages when we were starting to apply genetic approaches. And so I'm sure most of you you know, know about these uh, nowadays, but it was, it was quite new um, a while back when we could use, we use what are called microsatellite DNA techniques. So you know that everybody gets, you know, one copy of your genes from mom and one copy of your genes from dad, and we all have two copies. And these particular markers that we're working on, these genetic markers, um, they, they just differ in the size. This is just showing different sizes. It's just the number of nucleic acid bases in each strand of DNA. 
in this particular section of the genome. And so we would call this an allele. These are not really um, coding genes, they're non-coding, but here's allele one, here's allele two. Dad has allele two and allele three, and the baby gets one from mom. In this case, they got allele number two, and one from dad got allele number two. So that's the way that you could tell you know, whether this uh, offspring is potentially related or not related, or is the offspring of both parents. Um, had the offspring had uh, you know, uh, one, one, um, then quite clearly this would not have been the dad, or had it had three, three, that would not have been the mom. So we can use these kind of techniques at a large number of markers to determine who's really the mom. So when we did that with Noel, no, Noel's, excuse me, Noel, Nicole's work, Nicole, Nicole Odell, uh, it surprised us. We found that almost half of the nests had more than one female contributing eggs to the nest. And, and almost a fifth of the young were, did not belong to the mother that was, that was incubating them, raising them. In some cases, it was as much as 70% of the young in a female's nest were not her own. So she was providing a lot of care to foster kids. Um, and that genetic work also showed that the number of uh, these parasitic females per nest could go anywhere from one to five. So this is a graph. I, I'm going to try not to be too graphy in this talk. I don't know what the, um, the background of the audience is. I'll try to explain them. If you don't understand anything, please stop me and I'll explain further. But um, this is just a graph of the number of parasite females per nest. So one, two, three, four, five. And this is just how frequently that was observed. So a lot of the times, almost 50% of the time, uh, there would be just one parasitic female, but, but sometimes you got as many as five. And the average was was over one, it was, it was almost two parasitic females per nest. So lots of stuff going on here, lots of parasitism, a bunch of parasites hanging out in the same nest and a lot of young that are raised by other females. So that's, oh, that's back. Oh, there's got a, a question. A few questions asking sure. about how the, the, the parasitic mothers are, are related possibly. I think <laughs> are, but I just you're think you're stealing my thunder. That's a great yeah. question. And I'm gonna make you hold that question for a little bit longer, because I promise you, I will get around to it, but yes. Uh, and if you're looking for uh, for summer employment next year, we'll hire you. It sounds like you've uh, you've got it all figured out. <laughs> Whoever asked that, it's a great question. It's a great question. Was there more, Bill? Uh, no, there's a few more questions, but I think you're going to address a lot of them, so I'm going to wait. Okay. Until later. Let's let's see how omniscient I am and if I can answer your questions. But uh, but it's great. It's just it's just fun to think about this, and I, I really appreciate your your thoughts. So this is where we got serious about it. This and you know we were doing it mostly as an undergrad project, and then I kind of said, well, you know, let's see if we can't peel uh, peel a layer off this onion. And so with Bruce uh, Lyon and Eli Bridge, um, we uh, we were fortunate to get an NSF grant, and and really what it was was applying new technology to try to study uh, social behavior in, in a wild population of vertebrates. Um, the the technology is, uh, that we're using, well, we're using a variety, but is is these pit tags, passive integrated transponders, and it's just this little glass encased uh, tag. It's just a coded wire tag. Uh, it doesn't send out a signal, but when it's queried, so there's an electromagnetic pulse is sent to it, it sends back simply a binary unique code, and then that can be recorded on a device. And, uh, and so the individual is, is, um, is identified. And this is exactly the same as you use for your pets. It's what you, the chips that you put in pets. And then, you know, the vet would have a reader that sends the electromagnetic signal to the tag and gets the binary code back and tells that uh, this is indeed Fido. Um, and it's been used a lot in, in fish, for example, uh, for salmon and, and uh, lots of other species uh, it pretty broadly. What you need, though, is not just the tag. You also need some device to be able to read the tags, to be able to send the, the pulse of energy to activate the tag, and the tag will then send back the binary code. So you need what's called an RFID or a radio frequency identification device. Um, the challenge up until then is those were pretty expensive, and we wanted to put one on every single nest box. Uh, you know, they were about $1,000 a piece. So there's no way we could do that. And that's where Eli's ingenuity came in. He developed, and I'll show you a picture in a second, a way that we could actually build these readers for about 50 bucks a piece. And that was a game changer because now we could put them on every single nest box. So here's just a picture. Here's the size of it. This is a female's foot. Here's a leg band for any of you who are familiar with with um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service or the USGS leg bands. Uh, here's the, the size, the tag, here's a dime. So you can see it's smaller than a dime. And just with a little needle, little, little bit of uh, alcohol and, and anesthetic, you can, you can just put it subcutaneously, just 
very quickly underneath the skin in the back of a female and even a duckling. And they really don't seem to react at all. There's just not a lot of innervation in the, in the back of a bird. It's mostly just the, the nerves that would attach to the feathers. And there's these open feather tracks where there are no feathers, so apteria. So um, it actually is, is surprisingly effective. And we did a lot of testing, making sure that there were no health effects to the birds with birds in captivity, et cetera. So it works well. And then, and then what we have is we have an antenna around each nest box entrance. And then the readers in this box, I'll show you that in a second, and it's powered by a battery. The battery is needed to send the, the power, the radio uh, signal through the, um, the antenna that queries the tag, and then that the, the code will be, uh, will be recorded. And here's this little device that Eli developed. It was just sensational. Um, and so basically the, you know, the antenna, the power through the antenna queries the tag and it comes back and we can store all the information on a little SD card. So we put one of these up on every single nest box. And every time a female or a duckling comes in or out of the box, here's the antenna, it would read her, her tag. So we now have a completely wired population. And over the course of the study, we've now tagged over 600 females and over 5,000 ducklings. Uh, and this is on four different ranches, four different study sites. And every single nest box has, has a tag. And we've got, I think it's probably over 2 million reads as of now. So it's a pretty big data set we're working with. So I'm just, the next few slides, I'm just gonna show you some of, and this is what really surprised us. We really had no idea. Um, what I'm showing you on the left, and I'll show you several of these, these that look very similar. These are nest boxes, these little black dots. And, and this is a female. And what you're gonna see is sort of the trajectory over the whole spring of the boxes that she visits and then you'll see the, the circles around these boxes becoming bigger. And that reflects how long or how many times that female has been on the box. So here's one female, I'll just let you watch. So you can see she's bouncing around all of those nest boxes. The yellow lines just show the paths that, she, that she's sort of following. And you can see this one's getting larger and redder. This is one of her favorite boxes. This orange one seems also to be another favorite. So that's one female, and this is uh, the entire season. This was from, from basically from uh, April, I think it was, or even March um, to the end of June. And you can see she's really got a few red boxes there that she really seems to like. Here's another female, just by contrast. She was a stay-at-home mom. She did not visit another single box. And so that was really surprising to us, just this, this range of boxes. Here's, here's just a snapshot of that one female. This is her pit tag code. Uh, I'll refer to her as just E9. And you can see where she was bouncing around all over the place and see how there's different boxes with different intensities of use. Um, this is a, we've actually started using a little bit of a newer software. It's a bit easier to see. So this is, this is her actually the next year, but you can see um, a little bit more uh, sequentially how she's moving from box to box to box. And, and we really had no idea. We, you know, we knew that wood ducks would, would investigate boxes. That's in the literature. We know that they explore prior to nesting. This is during the entire nesting year. Um, and, and the range over which they're covering, in some cases, I'll show you another slide, is as much as five miles, or uh, yeah, five miles. Um, th this is about half a mile here, this stretch of Conway Ranch. So it's really just quite, quite spectacular. There's, there's her, her pathway for the whole season. It's like a, a ball of yarn. Um, so here's this one female, EBA09. So what the heck are these females doing? So she was a one-year-old in 2015. She visited 34 different boxes, uh, 195 individual visits, including 30 to her favorite box. She laid 12 eggs in four different nests and they were all kind of in a row and there were just a few boxes down from where she'd hatched out the year before. So she's staying in the hood. She's staying in the local neighborhood. She never had a nest of her own in 2015. She came back in 2016. She was recorded on even more boxes, 42. Again, laid eggs, never incubated a nest, and she was a parasite. So very different story from what we were sort of understanding about their biology. And she's not alone. So here's just another example. This is one of our other ranches. It's a it's not linear, it's a whole area. This is Roosevelt Ranch. Um, this is about five miles across or so. I'm sorry, I guess that's really uh, about three miles across. Um, each one of these circles is a nest and the different colors are different females that are going to each of these different nest boxes. That's over the course of the year. So he here's what it looks like. Uh, again, each color is a different female. Uh, 
it it blew us away. We we had no idea there was this level of information gathering and nest visitation amongst all these females. And I've stripped this one down now just to show three three females: blue, orange, and and pink. I apologize um, for those of you who might not see these colors, uh, but you can just really see that these are just rovers going all about. But also up here, here's a female. She never went anywhere. She just stayed in her own box. This female went to two, brown, and this female was uh, in three, green. So rovers and stairs, it, it's really quite, quite striking. So here's how this kind of changes our viewpoint of, of what these birds are doing and has some population level consequence. Every study of wood ducks up until now, and most cavity nesting birds, um, identifies the birds based on catching them on the nest. And that's what this graph is showing. This is each one of these is an individual female, the little bar. This is her pit tag number. And, and this is the number of boxes that a female was recorded in. Now, so the red bars show the number of boxes in which we caught a female. Most of them, we just caught her in one box. And that's usually when she was nesting. Some females were never caught in a given year, so there's nothing there at all. Some, a few were in two. And now with the RFID, oops, sorry, this is what we find for those same females. I mean, it's just remarkable. Some females are in more than 50 boxes like this female here. And this female, in fact, was never caught on a nest. We didn't even know she was in the population. Um, all the way through, there's all these females that we never caught on a nest, and yet they're clearly in the population. They're visiting tons of boxes. It, I, when we first saw these data, we were just absolutely astounded. And you know, it really is just about new technology. And so when we look at all the females that we recorded, a bit over half we, we captured and we also got an RFID read on them. But for almost 40%, over a third, we never caught at all. We wouldn't even know they were there and we wouldn't have recorded them, nor would any other study have done so. So we're missing entirely a third of the population of females that are doing things. And as I'll show you, they're actually laying eggs as well. Um, that has a big impact in terms of all of our estimates of survival and recruitment of females. It really changes some of our fundamental demographic understandings of what's going on with these birds. So that was, that was pretty exciting. Sorry, this is a little bit more of a complicated graph, but this is showing the number of different boxes that a female was recorded on. And then this is just a frequency. This is just the, the count. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Giving away my punchlines. Um, so these, these females were found on a single box. There was, you know, in this particular case, 20, 22 different females were found only on a single box. And then we find other females around 50 boxes, 42 boxes. So you can really see the big range of these visitation patterns amongst females. And this little red graph is just, you know, that's what you expect if it was completely random. If females were paying no attention to ownership, you were just scattering them among boxes. And you can see that's not the case. It's not random. We have females that are stay-at-home moms, and we have females that are rovers and going all about the, um, the, the neighborhood. All right, well, so now we get into sort of, can we understand the social underpinnings? What the heck is going on with all these females? And, and now we're turning to, I mean, as you all know, you know, the social network, this is the sort of the Facebook story, but you know, all Facebook and Google, I mean, they're all tracking all of our moves and, and, uh, and, you know, who we hang out with and so forth. And, and, and there's lots of analytical tools to be able to do that. So we started applying that to the wood ducks, uh, because the wood ducks hang around together as well when they're visiting boxes, either checking boxes out for their own nest or laying eggs in each other's nests. We can track that with the new FRD. And so we can develop literally a social network. And our pun is a social nest work. Sorry. Um, so each one of these points is an individual female. The lines connect females that visit nests together. And so what you see is there's sort of a core group of, uh, or core groups of females that, that visit many nests together, shown by these red circles. And then there's these peripheral females that are really non-social explorers. So you really do get different flavors of females. So this is just, um, this was from a CWA magazine article that Tez and I wrote. Um, that Holly Heiser made this nice little graphic. And you see, it's just, it's just like a human click. click. Uh, you know, you get sort of this core, the cool kids, six hands, they're all tightly connected. They all hang out together. Then there's some hands that are sort of on the periphery, but they're sort of social, but they're not quite as connected. And here's where I would have been in high school. So these are, these are the non-social hands hanging out. They're probably out hiking and, and uh, falling off cliffs and stuff like that. Um, so very much. And in fact, I just, you know, I was looking for simple graphics on the web and, and I was amazed. Here was one for sort of, you know, 
a human social web and it's almost verbatim this wood duck one so it's really quite remarkable and just just to show you that i'm not making this up here are the actual females these are their pit tags and you can kind of see here's these some social core groups and then you also get those peripheral females okay now turning to the second part of the study or uh, the the second technological aspect i've only got about 10 minutes left here so um this was applying some of our new population genetic techniques and it wasn't just the simple microsatellites we now have developed a new set of markers. They're called single nucleotide polymorphisms. I won't go into explaining them, but basically it just gets us literally thousands of individual sites where there's variability among individuals. And by having many, many, many sites, you can really get a very accurate representation of genetic relatedness, parentage and kinship. And it'll come back to that kinship question that somebody posed. And so with these new tools, what we found is there really is a, a very different social system of these females, that, that many of these females that are on a nest are also laying eggs in other females' nests. Up to 39% of the females that have a nest of their own are also laying parasitically. And as we delved into it more thoroughly, this is uh, Kara Thal's thesis, which she just finished up. We find that there are actually three different types of females in any given year. There are some females that only lay their eggs parasitically. So they come in and they lay their eggs in another female's nest. They never incubate a nest of their own that year. Then there are what we think, think of as the typical females, the nesters, and they establish their own nest, incubate their own nest. This is what we think ducks would do. And then there are these females that do both, a third group. So they come in and lay some eggs parasitically, but they also establish their own nest and incubate their own clutch. So you get parasites, nesters, and dual nesters, or nesters and parasites. And this is just a pie chart showing you the frequency of the females that we've tracked so far. About 37% are doing what we think is the standard duck thing, nesting only. 24% roughly are only laying eggs parasitically and another 40% are doing both. So it really is, I mean, all three of these tactics are quite widespread. Okay, this is a little bit more of a busier graph, but it really just shows you the reproductive success, the number of ducklings produced by females that are doing these three different uh, modes of reproduction, following these three different modes of reproduction. The boxes here just represent about 75% of the observations. That's the way to think of it. It goes from the 25th to the 75th quartile. And these horizontal lines are just giving you the, the middle value, the median. And I've shown you the means here, the averages. And so the parasite only get about 6.4 ducklings. And these are lifetime. We follow these birds through their lifetime. The nesting only females get about 8.7 ducklings and the females that do both at 14.4 and that's all based on these new genetic models um one last sort of complicated graph what we've also been able to do is follow these females over multiple years you know we wanted to know are these are there professional parasites or do females switch and it turns out they actually switch quite a bit um, the parasite only so that here's the parasite only this 38 percent of them died that's what this little black cross <laughs> so uh, you know skull and crossbones here um, but only about 5% are, are parasitic from one year to the next. So that E9 was a little bit, uh, a little bit unique. Um, a majority of the parasite only is if they come back, then become nesters and parasites. So it looks like parasitism is just sort of part of their, part of their main strategy. Of the females that are on the nest only, a lot of them will just return to nest about 36%, but some will switch and become nesting and parasitic. Likewise, some of the nesting parasites will also um, drop out of the parasite tactic and just become nest only. So there's a lot of a lot of shifting this. These are not permanent strategies. And so here's here's sort of the story to this point of what we think is going on. The parasite only females, and and we're currently working on this. We have all the data, but seem to be younger females and in poorer conditions. Um, maybe the food resources are eliminating for them or nest sites, and they're just inexperienced. So they're kind of doing a risk prone strategy while playing uh, entering into the reproductive arena. The nesting only females, that's kind of the status quo. These seem to be females, they're in good enough condition. I mean, they have to be in good shape because they, they have to incubate a nest for 30 days. They're not, they're not spending a lot of time on feeding and self-maintenance. So they, they actually, uh, it, it, and there's some risk of predation while they're in the nest. So these are females that are in good condition and, and where the resources are, are sufficient for them to actually breed. And then these dual nesters, the nesters and parasites seem to be females that are in really good condition Perhaps they have access to excess resources, they're more experienced, and they're actually getting this enhancement, this extra reproduction of their fecundity by laying some eggs parasitically as well as not. 
So that's, that's kind of our understanding of the system. But now I will get to this question that somebody asked about, are these females related? And it's a great question because ducks, unlike most species of birds, it's the females that are what are called philopatric. It's the females that return to where they hatched out their birth or really their hatching site to breed, their natal site. In most other birds, it's the males that do that, but the females and ducks do it. So female wood ducks come back to, their, to where they were hatched out. That means that they can come back to where their sisters were or their mothers or grandmothers or cousins. So it could be that these females are indeed related. So maybe this isn't parasitism at all. Maybe it's just you know family daycare or communal living and we're going back to Woodstock where it's all about peace, music and love. Um, so we're able to assess that and we're just getting going on that with the genetic uh, analyses. This is one of the social networks I showed you. And we've now sort of parsed that out and these are now clusters of related individuals. So um, in other words, significantly related greater than random or greater than zero. And so you can see there, you know, these social networks are indeed comprised of little groups of related females, not exclusively. Some of these clusters have unrelated females still hanging out together. And, and it starts to remind me really of a sort of, of our own social networks. You know, we're hanging around with friends. We grew up with all the kids, you know, sort of running around terrorizing the neighborhood. Some of them are siblings. Um, if we live in an area where cousins are around, maybe some of them. So it really seems very similar to human society, surprisingly so. And, and using some of our genetic methods, this is where this is still work we're, we're doing. We've been looking at these, um, the, the parasites and the hosts, the females that are sharing nests together and asking if they're more related than you'd expect based on the average level of relatedness. Our here is just relatedness. And these bars just indicate the sort of the averages and these are just measures of, of uh, the variation. So on some ranches like Conway Ranch, indeed, um, the hosts and the parasites, the females that shared nests were related at about the level of cousins on average uh, as compared to sort of the background level of relatedness. But on another ranch, Russell Ranch, there was no difference. So, so the kinship seems to be coming into play, but, but um, it's, not, it's not the only thing. Uh, I don't have time really to, to go into this in detail. I just wanted to show you uh, just really quickly some of the other work. We're starting to get now more into the endocrinological basis of this. Uh, some of our early work looked at, at hormones in eggs. There was work by Hubert Schwabel and a number of other researchers suggesting that females may dope their eggs. They may load them up, particularly with uh, testosterone or androstenedione um, uh, steroids that basically could enhance the growth rates and perhaps post-hatch survival of the young. So Nicole O'Dell um, did the study. And in fact, what we found is that these parasitic eggs, the parasitic offspring, actually their eggs had higher levels of A4, which is a, a te testosterone precursor. Um, excuse me, testosterone precursor, uh, as compared to, to the non-parasitic egg. So uh, we haven't gone too far into it. That's new work we're just sort of diving into, but uh, it opens up the, pop you know, the possibility that these females are playing chemical warfare and uh, some of these parasitic females may be on steroids. Okay, let me, let me finish up in the last couple of minutes here and bring us back to kind of the conservation story. As I mentioned, wood ducks were on the verge of extinction in the early 1900s. And, uh, and nest box programs played an important role in, in their recovery, at least until some of those you know, mature hardwood forests developed uh, to be large enough to, to provide natural cavities. One of the things that has been found time and time again in these nest box programs is when they start the program off, this is, this is the Great Swamp natural, uh, National Wildlife Refuge, all of a sudden you just get a boom in productivity, you get lots of eggs being laid, that's shown in the red here, and then you get a drop off. And that sort of, you know, maintains itself and fluctuates at a lower level. And likewise, the, the lower uh, sort of uh, tan, tan color, you get lots of ducklings produced and then it drops off. So, so why is it dropping off? Well, um, several years ago, a couple of uh, scientists said, you know, what's going on is we are changing their social system with all of these nest boxes. And it's not just providing nest boxes, it's how we're providing them. Um, the idea was if one box is good, then, then many is even better. Let's put as many houses out as we can. And, and literally, people, this is a, from Bell Rose's book, but we'll put them up the, two feet apart. You know? um, and the idea is that in a natural cavity situation, sometimes they're back to back. The concern was now females were uh, basically living in, a, you know, sort of in an apartment situation. There was no way they, uh, they could sort of protect their nest 
And the idea was you get these elevated levels of this parasitism, of this brood parasitism, and you get these massive clutches. And when you get these really big clutches, a lot of eggs don't hatch. You get a lot of rotten eggs. They just can't be incubated. And here's a graph just showing you, this is the different clutch sizes, the number of eggs in a nest. And these are from some of our data. The points just represent the averages with a measure of variation around that for each clutch size. And you can see as you get beyond about 25 eggs, hatch success, the proportion of both those eggs that hatch out just plummets and become zero after about 30, 35 eggs. And so the idea is that in a natural cavity situation, nests would often be far away from water, they would be dispersed, they'd be hidden, so you can just probably barely see it. So, so this behavior would occur, but it wouldn't occur at such high frequencies. When you put the boxes out in these high densities with no, uh, you know, totally visible, no cover uh, whatsoever, now you get these exacerbated levels of, of parasitism. So that was, that was the concern about these nest box programs. So one of the things we did with this internship program earlier on was we said, well, Let's do this experimentally. And so we created some low density populations and some high density populations where we put boxes up in high density and we asked what happened. And now with our new technology, we can follow what the birds are actually doing. So here's our, here's our RFIDs again. Uh, in this case, each one of these bars represents a different nest site, a different nest box. So on three ranches, Conway Ranch, which was a high density site, Roosevelt, where we had some high density boxes, but we also spread some out low density. We did a mixed treatment. And then Russell Ranch, which was intended to be sort of a low, more sort of a natural density. And you can see on the high density, we're just getting tons and tons of females visiting these boxes, 50 females, you know, 45 females, et cetera. Um, on the mixed density, we're on the high density areas, we're getting lots of females. On the low density area, not as many. And then in the low density, we're getting few as well. And so we've looked at the frequency of parasitism, the number of parasitic eggs. And again, this is over a long-term study. Yes, parasitism seems high, not always. There's some drops, but parasitism is higher when we get these really high density of boxes and hatch success that's shown in the red. These are the high densities. The blue here is the low density sites. Hatch success is lower. So, you know, that sort of seemed to support these uh, investigators' thoughts that maybe putting these high density of boxes out in close proximity wasn't a good idea, but there's a catch. If you actually look at the total number of ducklings produced, right? Because a lot more females are breeding at these high densities. And this is for our data, the total number of ducklings produced on these high density areas in almost every single year, there's a few exceptions, is higher. So that kind of raises an interesting uh, dilemma for the manager on these low density sites, the more so-called natural pristine sites, this behavior is less frequent, there's less parasitism, hatch success is higher, you don't have as many nests, you don't have as many eggs laid, and overall production, the number of recruits you produce, or at least the number of ducklings you produce is lower. On the high density area, a lot more of this behavior, we sort of really seem to elevate it, hatch success is lower, but also there's more nests, more eggs are being laid, and there's greater total production. So, you know, it, it kind of depends on whether you want to go with a more naturalistic situation or whether you want to just try to get as many babies produced as possible. What we're currently working on now, and we've done some research, I don't have time to talk to you about it, but um, is looking actually at the population dynamics. Uh, what we think is under these high density situations, you get much more variable fluctuating populations. And that could be a concern for longer term sustainability of these populations. So that's where we're going. I just had uh, you know, an opportunity to touch on a few of these things, but it really is a remarkable system with all sorts of layers from the physiological, the you know, cognitive to the population level and, and from the social behavioral genetic level. Uh, it's really been pretty fun. And, and uh, um, we're sort of you know, wrapping up three PhDs and two master's theses right now to sort of try to bring some of the story home. So in two years, I hopefully will have a, have a full story. So just, just to close off, um, you know, we really had no idea. We knew this behavior occurred, but we just had no idea of sort of all these social interconnections and the sneaky behaviors. It's a lot more complex than we thought. Uh, we don't really know what the differences are between these females. Is it genetic? Is it physiological? Is it hormones? Is it how they were brought up? Um, are there kin-based, uh, you know, how, how important is this kin-relatedness-based aspect of these social networks or what else is forming these, uh, these roving nest box gangs? Um, why are females hanging out together? What are the benefits? What are the costs? And, and of course, the physiological underpinnings. If moms are starting to play chemical warfare on each other, that's just another whole layer of complexity. And, and then, and you know, again, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm particularly interested in how our study of this behavior is great to know from first principles. I'm a behavioral biologist, but 
but how does it impact actually our management and our population dynamics? As a conservation biologist, that's an important concern. So there are indeed uh, duck secrets that you know sometimes we don't uh, we don't really fully realize until we look beneath the surface. Um, and we can sometimes see a world we never imagined, and, and there are secrets that, that amaze us, impress us, astound us, confound us, and, and uh, we don't have to look any further than our backyards. So um, there's still surprise. And here I am after, you know, God knows how many years, getting close to 35 years of research on waterfowl, I'm still totally surprised by some of the things we're finding. So the, the last note is just, you know, it looks like wood ducks have come back uh, from sort of the verge of extinction, um, thanks to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and habitat restoration. Uh, I would want to caution, though, that, you know, we don't want to emphasize artificial means such as nest boxes as a, as a primary way to restore their habitats. We still need their natural cavities. Uh, nest boxes, as, as our work have shown, uh, can present some challenges and also have to be maintained. Um, I have to give a shout out to, to the California Waterfowl Association in California and Ducks Unlimited nationally for, for their work on these programs. It, it's a great citizen science effort. So, um, and if you have any more interest in this, so if I haven't totally lulled you into uh, sleep, um, I, I've actually done a couple of podcasts with the Ducks Unlimited podcast, uh, one episode just on this behavior of brood parasitism and one on, on the wood duck story itself with uh, Mike Brazier, the host. So. Um, here's the site if you want to go and hear more about the story. So I just want to thank my colleagues, Bruce Lyon and Eli Bridge. They're my two uh, collaborators and co-conspirators, a whole brood of, of phenomenal graduate students and phenomenal undergraduate students, and then funding from, uh, from a variety of sources that made this possible. So that's it for the talk. I'm a few minutes long. I apologize, but I hope, uh, I hope you are as uh, confounded as I am and have been and uh, look forward to telling you more about it in the future. So there we go, Bill. Over to uh, wow. over to you, or over to questions. Well, wow. that that was incredible, John. Uh, and there's so many thought-provoking things in there, and I've got a million questions myself. But I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go through some of the other questions. And I know sure, you've got yeah. a hockey game tonight, so yeah, I you know my old Canadian roots here. I still play ice hockey, and I've got a game out at Roseville uh, at ten o'clock. God knows why. Um, so I, I, I need to leave by about eight thirty if I can. Yeah. Okay. So thank back you. To... Thank, thank you all, by the way, for, for staying on. I see there's a bunch of people here and I uh, appreciate your comments and, and, uh, and attention. Thanks. Yeah. It, well, it was really great talk. So here's some questions. All right. Uh, the first one uh, was back to that, that video you had about the, the females fighting in their nests in the nest. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, why don't females. <laughs> Uh, subject to aggression, leave the box. Is there a strong? I have no idea. So Catherine, Catherine Cook is, is analyzing. She has hours and hours and hours of video. And in every single case, it's, it's absolutely bizarre. It's got us completely uh, befuddled. Um, these females, they, they just hunker down. They don't, they don't even fight back. They just hunker down. And, and there's, uh, there's records, and we've seen it on the video, where it's called scalping. It sounds horrible, and that's, that's probably not an appropriate term. But they, literally, the feathers on the back of their neck, the back of their head are pulled off. Um, so you can see how the female was, was grabbing at the back and tussling and she was actually doing a, you know, a world, uh, world wrestling federation kind of thing with them. And, um, and they don't fight back and they just sit there until they lay an egg and go. So the only explanation we have for that is, is that, and I think this is maybe a bit of an evolutionary legacy that nest, bite, nest sites historically were much less common. They were just an incredible, uh, incredibly valuable resource, they were actually worth fighting to the death to. And so I suspect that may be sort of, you know, a bit of the behavioral pattern that they've inherited. Now with nest boxes in high densities, that's not the case, but it doesn't mean that the behavior might not be expressed. So that that's our best guess. I have no idea why they do it. I, it almost seems like just get out of there as soon as the female starts to attack. And they don't. They don't. Across the board, we've, we've analyzed many of these nests and it just, <laughs> it's another one of those mysteries. So there's, I have a number of questions and there's a couple of questions in here about males. So you're talking about females the whole time. Do males have any participation in the, in the nesting or the raising? I saw one picture where they were sitting on top of the box. Are they yeah, part yeah. of the social network? Well, my, my, my sort of cheek, uh, cheeky response would be, no, they're duds. Dads are duds. I mean, they're really, they're just really, you know, um, 
interested in sort of meeting with the females and that's mostly what they do. However, that's probably uh, unfair to the males. The males do, when the females are laying eggs, the males will often sit on top of the nest box, you'll find that. And we'll often find remains of males underneath the nest box, suggesting they've been taken out by a raptor, great horned owl or, or a hawk. Um, so I think they're guarding. I don't know that they're guarding the female to protect her. I think they're guarding the female to protect her from mating with other males. Uh, in many <laughs> cases, um, our genetic studies are showing the females are mating with multiple males as well. So there's a real skullduggery that's going on uh, underneath the surface between males and females. But the males play no part in building the nest. They play no part in incubating and they play no part in caring for the kids. Uh, so it really is a very matrilineal system, which is interesting because it's all these social dynamics among the females um, that have caught our interest. And that's really what's driving, driving the population and the behavioral dynamics. And at this so males point, are males are duds. Catching any males, right? No, act, no, we're not actually. Um, well, males are harder to catch because they're not on the nest. Um, we have caught males in in uh, decoy traps and bait traps, um, but we haven't been following males. Um, every single duckling is pit tagged, and so that's you know fifty percent males, fifty percent females. Um, we've actually had a few cases where males have gone into the nest, so we've got their pit tag reads. But other than that, no. So. Uh, there could still be things that are going on outside the nest, and that's a next phase is sort of setting up a camera system to see what's going on, you know, in the trees nearby or in the boxes nearby. We've done some observations, but um, but by and large, and the males will fight with each other, and and but that's really more about courting and mating uh, than it is about, than it is about egg laying. So here's a good one. Um, so how, over how many days are the eggs in a nest laid? And do all the eggs in one nest hatch on the same day, regardless of when they're laid? So the last, the answer to the last question is yes, um, as long as they're laid before the female starts to incubate. Uh, uh, that's actually with a little bit of a caveat, because sometimes females will lay eggs in a nest and then leave, these parasitic females. And then two weeks later, another female will come and will use that nest. And so one of those uh, bubbles that I showed you was the cognitive aspects. And we were curious whether females would avoid nests with eggs, or if the number of eggs that were already in a nest would influence their decision to use that nest. And what we found is if there was five to 10 eggs in a nest, another female would come in, would lay her own eggs and would incubate the nest. So it's almost like preemptive parasitism. I don't even have, I can just lay an egg there and somebody is gonna eventually come and incubate it. Um, if, but we also see females laying parasitic eggs after the host begins incubating. And that boggles me as well. We can tell that the host is incubating. I don't know why they can't. They know what incubation is all about better than we do, but they will lay eggs like two or three days before the nest hatches, which is absolutely useless. And these are energy rich eggs. So that doesn't make too much sense to us. Um, the number of days depends on the number of eggs. Typically a female will lay one egg a day. So for a single female, she'll often lay over you know, 12 to 14 days. But again, for those females that are parasitizing and nesting, um, sometimes they will lay their eggs in another nest first and then come back to their own nest and lay their full clutch. Sometimes while they're laying eggs in their own nest, they will also go side by side to somebody else's nest and lay an egg there. So there could be skips in laying um, when they're not laying in their own nest. So it, it really is, uh, we, we have all the data uh, on that. And it's, you know, um, it, there are differences between females in their egg laying patterns. The stairs are just, they're kind of like your standard, you know, what we'd expect is sort of a typical mom. She just lays an egg a day and she does that for her, until her clutch is laid and then she incubates them and, and off she goes. But other females are doing all these other kind of crazy wacky things. So um, we're, we're just getting a better handle on that. But yeah, so there's still some mysteries there. I, the, the biggest mystery for me is why lay an egg in a nest of a female three days before that nest is gonna hatch. I, it just seems like a huge uh, expenditure of resources in those eggs. Uh, that you would think natural selection would be strongly acting against. So I don't have an answer for that yet. Now here's one, I think you may have covered it and I apologize if you did. Are related ducks more tolerant of parasitism? Yeah, great question. And Catherine's answering that right now. So we had to get the cameras in the nest to see who was tolerant and who was aggressive. And now we have a, a slew of vials sitting in the lab waiting for our genetic analyses over the last two years. Because of COVID, we haven't been able to get them analyzed in the lab because the labs have been pretty much shut down on campus or, or sort of working at a very low rate. So uh, we have two years of data attendant with all the camera data. The hypothesis is 
that yes, the females that are tolerant to one another are related, or at least they are buddies, you know, so they could be social. And so there could be other benefits that are not genetic of, of playing nice with a, with a partner. Um, the ones that are fighting to the death, I predict are not related, but, but we will see. Um, there is some, there's actually a number of theoretical models that would predict the level of aggression that would be expected for the level of relatedness and the cost of caring for extra kids, depending on the number of kids. So there's a number of theoretical mathematical models that we'll be able to test when we get the DNA. Thanks to COVID, that's on hold. Okay, here's a related question. Do the nest mothers ever throw out or destroy? <laughs> These are great questions. I want to hire you all. <laughs> um, yes, they do. But we don't yet know if that's uh, a directed act. So all birds, and particularly wood ducks, will remove broken eggs from their nest. And we've got photos of females with eggs in their nest, removing them, and they'll actually eat the yolk. Uh, and I think that's just a nest cleaning and nest protection thing. You know, you don't want an egg breaking and falling up the nest. So the females will actually remove that. And, and there have been studies where people have glued little pieces of broken eggs to, to fake eggs and the, the birds will remove those, not in wood ducks. So we do see a lot of eggs that do go missing. And, and in these big clutches and where you get these fights, you know, you saw those two females, eggs often get broken in those fights, which also makes those, that, that, you know the extremeness of those fights perplexing to us like this is a really dumb thing to do it's really risky why are you doing it um and so we see broken eggs and those eggs get removed what we don't know and we haven't seen strong evidence that eggs that we've identified as parasitic are being intentionally removed um you do see that in in um obligate brood parasites like cowbird some of the cowbird hosts some of the cuckoo hosts they'll actually remove the parasite eggs uh, but we haven't found evidence of that in wood ducks yet. We thought we might, but we, we haven't seen anything like that. But eggs do get removed. Okay, here's another one. Um, is, is there dilution of the genetic pool in the higher density duck populations? So dilution some sort of, of the genetic pool. Oh. Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Well, I could see that working two ways. Um, so I could see in a small population, you would have a small number of individuals. So in that case, you might actually, you know, find that you, particularly given the high level of filipatry, you might have somewhat more of an inbred population. Depends on the rates of immigration and emigration. Doesn't take a lot to sort of uh, swamp sort of genetic drift or genetic load. Um, in these high density populations, uh, again, you know, I, I could see where if they, they build up to the point, I mean, I guess in these high density populations, it it, it, it's not so much the density, it's the level of immigration and emigration. Population size, as long as you have a uh, somewhat um, uh, mixed population when those high density populations are established, then, then presumably, just given the samples, the, the number of birds, genetic drift and genetic load would be reduced in those high populations. That's my sort of quick response to that but i but i don't know for sure so i think the key is you know and, and what we do see is some of these small populations they can sort of blip out to extinction they sort of you know locally extirpated now whether that's due to inbreeding and genetic load or whether that's just due to random demographic uh, events is probably it could be both we actually don't see i mean we see some level of kinship but we don't see you know there's there's still lots of genetic variation in these birds so i don't i don't think we're seeing a situation where there's a you know paucity of genetic diversity is causing is causing problems. Um, yeah, it seems like the birds flying around all over this, mixing their eggs everywhere increases. Diversity. Yeah, well, so that's, and that's an interesting question. I know maybe that's part of it. And I saw Paul, yes, hi Paul, um, uh, ask a question about um, spreading one's eggs, you know, so that, that was one of the early ideas for this. It's like, don't put your eggs all in one basket, literally, you know, sort of by spreading your eggs amongst uh, several nests, you might, uh, you might do better. If your nest gets depredated, then You've got some eggs that'll make it in another nest. The, the problem with that is, is it doesn't sort of, um, it, it doesn't pan out mathematically that, that you really have to have, um, a, a, you know, sort of a pretty significant effect of that variance. It's really reducing the variance and reproductive success um, because there's just as much of a chance that any one of those eggs will be lost in those other nests as well. So, so the risk spreading idea has always been really attractive, but some mathematical models have suggested that it's not really likely unless unless um, there really are differences um, 
in, in predation rates amongst nests and, and differences in the success rates of those nests that are parasitized or not parasitized. So that was one of our first thoughts. It's just like, yeah, don't put your eggs all in my basket, but, but it seems not to have, um, have been well supported in other studies. The birds that don't end up um, brooding and, and hatching the eggs, do they participate at all in raising of any other? <laughs> and that's a great question as well. We don't know. We don't know. There's some interesting observations, and, and you'll see this sort of anecdotally. Um, wood ducks are hard to watch after they hatch. They're very secretive. They're very flighty. Golden eyes are great. Uh, wood ducks are much more challenging. They'll hang out in woody vegetation, so it's really hard to see what's going on. It's well known that ducklings from different broods in wood ducks, as well as many other species of waterfowl, will amalgamate, will join broods after hatching. Uh, it's also known that some wood ducks will leave their young 30 days after hatch and then have a second brood, double brooders. So those kids, I mean, after about the first two weeks of age, those kids are pretty, you know, they can, they can pretty much make it on their own. Uh, those first two weeks are really the initial gauntlet. So, um, and there's also observations, uh, and we've, I've seen this when females are hatching out and other females will fly in and they'll be sitting in the box. It's kind of like, Hey, let's see what's going on. And, and I've wondered, are they checking to see if their eggs are hatching or their kids are hatching or are these young females that are just saying, Oh, that's how you do it. Okay. I can do that. You know? Um, so there are observations of, you know, you'll see a female with a wood duck brood and then another female hanging by. I don't think these, uh, I don't think these parasitic non breeding females are really playing an active role. If anything, they're probably learning and gaining information. I would suspect um, from observing. I don't think they're, they're not helpers at the nest as you find in other, for example, cooperative breeders. So here's a simple one. Um, how do the female on the eggs eat? Uh, well, they take an incubation break. Um, I, I was going to be glib and say they eat, they eat the eggs that are broken. Um, they, they take uh, usually two incubation breaks, you know, sort of one uh, in the morning, uh, eight or nine o'clock for an hour, and then usually another one later in the afternoon, just before, just before dusk. Um, and so they'll go off and, and, uh, and feed themselves during incubation, but it's only twice a day, you know, and they're off the nest for an hour or so. Uh, depends on the weather, of course, whether that'll influence the incubation uh, success of the nest. Um, and then just before the nest hatches, they'll often be away almost for, you know, they can be six, eight, 12 hours. Um, some of that may be restoring some of the, the, you know, the weight that they've lost while incubate, uh, incubating, um, gaining nutrient reserves because they're going to be looking after kids. And some of it mostly is probably looking for somewhere to take the, uh, to take the youngsters. And, and they'll travel as much as a mile away from their nest box to their brood rain area, even sometimes when there's other, what look like good brood rain areas nearby. So they have very specific ideas about where they want to go. But yeah, so they take incubation breaks to, to eat during the day. Okay, I'll ask the very last question. <laughs> Great. Unless you have questions. some private ones in there. Uh, yeah. uh, is there any evidence that the chicks actually communicate in the shells so they all know when to hatch at the same time? Yes, there is. There's some really interesting. We, we haven't done it ourselves. Um, it's more work that's been done on mallards, but that's, so these are, these are precocial birds. They, you know, they're laid over a period of days, but the female doesn't begin to incubate until mm, actually until maybe this, the penultimate egg has been laid, you know, so sometimes she'll start to incubate a little bit earlier, but then all the young, there's, there's evidence now that the young will vocalize and some of those vocalizations will help them synchronize. We don't really know how, what the neurological and phrenological interface is, but it will help them synchronize their hatch. And then the females will communicate with the, the ducklings in the egg for two to three days before they hatch. So there's this whole communication thing going on beforehand. Um, some of that could be imprinting. Hey, I'm your mom. This is my voice. You know, if you get lost, remember who I am. Uh, some of it is, could be the kids saying, oh, you're, you're my broodmate. Uh, that's cool. And some of it could be facilitating um, uh, the synchronicity of the hatch because they all have to leave the nest within, really, they'll leave the nest within about 15 minutes of each other. Sometimes you'll get ducklings that are left behind the slow pokes and they'll come out 20 minutes later and the brood is gone. Um, so that, that hatch synchrony is really critical. All right, yeah. thank you, John. Um, and I said that was the last question, but there was a question that Mike asked and I promised that I would ask it. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I wish, I, I wish I, I, I'm amazed there's all these people. If, if only my students, I would have as many students 
<laughs> staying on if, after my lectures and asking great questions. It'd be, thank so you. how do the, do the moms actually keep track of the number of hat or the number of eggs and then the number of hatchlings and the number of chicks? Can they keep track of those huge broods? Yeah, I think they can. Well, I mean, so some of the work that we did, the cognition was, was whether wood ducks can count. And we think they have at least a crude sense of numerosity. So they can tell the difference between five eggs, 10 eggs, 15 eggs, and 20 eggs. That was our experiment. So they, they can actually tell and they respond differently to nests that have those different numbers of eggs. Um, and we also know, I, I don't know if this is true for wood ducks, but I know for golden eyes that they can also tell when the brood gets below a certain threshold in fact, it turns out to be about four ducklings and females will often abandon their brood when they get below four ducklings. And, and partly we've done the calculations. Very few of those ducklings when you get below a brood size of four will make it. So it's just, it's sort of a, an investment game. At this point, it's not worth it. Sorry, kids, you're on your own. I'm going to invest in myself. And uh, if you make it, you make it. If you don't, you don't. It's not worthwhile investing. So uh, we, you know, I think that's a really interesting area as part of the cognitive uh, aspects that we want to delve into more. Uh, we're, we're learning more and more that animals have quite good numerosity capabilities. They can count um, under different situations. And we think that there's some level of that in wood ducks, most certainly. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John. Yeah. I'm sure we could go on for much longer. <laughs> it was super fun. Yeah. Th thanks a lot. Uh, this is, uh, it's been fun to sort of put some of this together and I hope I didn't overwhelm people with too many graphs and figures, but uh, uh, I'm an egghead, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks well, again, everybody. Good luck on your hockey game. Yeah, yeah. I'm too old to play, but too dumb to know better. So <laughs> yeah. I see Chris and Christy Dewey's on too. So hi, folks. And hi, many other folks that uh, I recognize your name. So uh, I hope you all are safe and healthy. And, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Hopefully see some of you in person soon. And Bill, it'd be great to talk to you about work with uh, Tuliomi in the future. Yes, I get I'd close to retirement. Okay. Thanks. Bye for now. Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody.